Hello everyone, my name is Ashley Gwen. I am the founder of Natural Nana and I just wanted to bring you some information that I believe may be of some interest to you. So this is a document that I found. It is from the Rockefeller Foundation and it's from a document called Scenarios for the Future of Technology and International Development. And so these are their scenario narratives. And so these are their scenario narratives. And this is what they consider um, a world of tighter top-down government control and more authoritarian leadership with limited innovation and growing citizenship push, growing citizen pushback. So this is what they, this is just a scenario. So this is what they hypothesized. Um, so let's just get started. In 2012, the pandemic that the world had been anticipating for years finally hit. Unlike 2009's H1N1, this new influenza strain originated, originating from wild geese was extremely virulent and deadly. Even the most pandemic prepared nations were quickly overwhelmed when the virus streaked around the world, affecting nearly 20% of the global population and killing 8 million in just seven months the majority of them healthy young adults. The pandemic also had a deadly effect on economies. International mobility of both people and goods screeched to a halt. Debil debil debilitating industries like tourism and breaking the global supply chains. Even locally, normally bustling shops and office buildings sat empty for months, devoid of both employees and customers. The pandemic blanketed the planet, though disproportionate numbers died in Africa, Southeast Asia, and Central America, where the virus spread like wildfire in the absence of official containment protocols. But even in developed countries, containment was a challenge. The United States' initial policy of strongly discouraging citizens from flying proved deadly in its leniency, accelerating the spread of the virus, not just within the US, but across borders. However, a few countries did fare better, China in particular. The Chinese government's quick imposition and enforcement of mandatory quarantine for all citizens, as well as the instant and near hermetic sealing off of all borders, saved millions of lives, stopping the spread of the virus far earlier than in other countries, and enabling a swifter post-pandemic recovery. China's government was not the only one that took extreme measures to protect its citizens from risk and exposure. During the pandemic, national leaders around the world flexed their authority and imposed airtight rules and restrictions, from the mandatory wearing of face masks to body temperature checks at the entry to communal spaces like train stations and supermarkets. Even after the pandemic faded, this more authoritarian control and oversight of citizens and their activities stuck and even intensify. In order to protect themselves from the spread of increasingly global problems, from pandemics and transnational terrorism to environmental crises and rising poverty, leaders around the world took a firmer grip on power. At first, the notion of a more controlled world gained wide acceptance and approval. Citizens willingly gave up some of their sovereignty and their privacy to more paternalistic states in exchange for greater safety and stability. Citizens were more tolerant and even eager for top-down direction and oversight. And national leaders had more latitude to impose order the way they saw fit. In developed countries, this heightened oversight took many forms. Biometric IDs for all citizens, for example, and tighter regulation of key industries whose stability was deemed vital for national interests. In many developed countries, enforced cooperation with the suite of new regulations and agreements slowly but steadily restored order. And importantly, um, <laughs> let me read that sentence again. In many developed countries, enforced cooperation with a suite of new regulations and agreements slowly but steadily restored both order and importantly, economic growth. Across the developing world, however, the story was different and much more variable. Top-down authority took different forms in different countries. Uh, 
um, hinging largely on the capacity, caliber, and intention of their leaders. In countries with strong and thoughtful leaders, citizens' overall economic st status and quality of life increased. In India, for example, air quality drastically improved after 2016 when the government outlawed high-emitting vehicles. In Ghana, the introduction of ambitious government programs to improve basic infrastructure and ensure the availability of clean water for all her people led to a sharp decline in waterborne illnesses. But more authoritarian leadership worked less well, and in some cases, tragically, in countries run by irresponsible elites who use their increased power to pursue their own interests at the expense of their citizens. So this paper actually does go on. You can read it yourself. As I said, this is called the scenario of the future of technology and development. This is by the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, I believe this is written, I actually don't know because it doesn't say, and I actually should have done the research before I got on here, right? Um, but it was, um, this is obviously old and let's see. I mean, some of this stuff is still really interesting. Some of this stuff is really interesting. I would say, I would definitely highly suggest if you can read this entire article. Okay. You can find it online. You can just Google it. And so they had some type of inkling that there would be a pandemic in the future. The issue is that there were no um, programs or strategies in place to actually take action when something like this hit. Um, so they are more reactionary as, a, as opposed to um, proactive as far as preventative. So, just so that you know, there's a couple other research papers that do express um, the potential benefits of Black Sea, which is also um, the scientific name is Nigella sativa. There's a couple research papers that are showing that it may inhibit coronavirus. So if people don't already have it, like everybody should be taking this just every day just to make sure that that virus cannot get into your body. But in addition to just taking a black seed oil, you also have to eat food that's going to help block viruses. If you're eating food that is going to cripple your body, if it's going to put your cells in rouleau, if it's going to weaken your white blood cells, you won't be able to fight a virus. Your body is just weak. You weak. Who want to be weak? So strengthen up, get your blood, uh, black seed oil, get your black seed tea, your black seed honey, however you want to take it. Just get it. Just take it. Okay. I don't even care if you don't buy it from me. I'm going to tell you I have the best because I know that and I only know because I make it myself. But if you want to go and go to Amazon and Google to search for the best company, feel free. But I'll tell you, it's nothing like what I have here.